Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to Film Music House Summer Edition in collaboration with the Perspective Forum on Facebook. Uh, today I have a very special friend, a dear friend, an amazing composer named the Queen of Documentary Scoring. Uh, and uh, the subject today is finding the right tone, how music influences storytelling. And I'm so grateful to have Miriam Cutler with us today. Hello, Miriam. Hello, Thomas. I'm so delighted to be here, always. And before we start the workshop, and you know, I've prepared some great videos with amazing acting, but we'll go into that <laughs> later. Uh, um, uh, and to show step by step uh, how how important it is to see to stay objective and stay true to the story and documentary filmmaking, especially, and how music can alter the outcome. But I, I want to talk a bit about your latest project. You were nominated two years ago for two Emmys for the new documentary category with RBG and uh, Love Gilder. And this year you did work on the PBS documentary Flannery. And um, for everyone that wants to listen to the music of Flannery, we have a Spotify link to the music down in the YouTube descriptions. But uh, Miriam, do you want to tell us a bit about the project and for people who don't know who Flannery O'Connor is? Sure. So Flannery O'Connor was a very important American writer who lived, you know, who was writing in the probably the early 40s uh, through, and into the 50s. Um, she wrote, she lived in the South. And so she was part of that um, very dynamic group of writers that came out of the South, whether it was Tennessee Williams and others. And uh, but she was by far the quirkiest. She really um, was kind of well known for her very eccentric characters and her take on Southern life. You know, she pointed out a lot of the hypocrisy, uh, a lot of the very overt racism. And so she became very important as a commentator of the times. Um, and so there were many scholars involved in making this film. I don't believe there's been too many films done about Flannery O'Connor, even though she is such an iconic American writer. So I was really, really excited to work on the film, um, especially because you know, they incorporated animation and all kinds of ways of illustrating some of her stories and they brought them to life with some really nice voice acting, things like that. And uh, and so it was really fun. It gave me a lot to play with the music. And uh, you love the blues and I think you were able to, to use some of that. Uh, yeah, I really love the blues. <laughs> it was, you know, I love slide guitar. I love the, the you know, a toothless old black guy playing a guitar, you know, James Johnson and I mean, not James Johnson, no. Anyway, all the great Southern uh, blues guys. And so I, I rarely get a chance to really use any of that. And then I always, you know, I had this idea to incorporate like a string sound, a small string sound ensemble um, with like slide guitar and, uh, you know, and also capture, because Flannery was also, while being a very quirky and eccentric person, she was a devout Catholic. And, and it was very unusual. I mean, Catholics were kind of almost considered as bad as Jews in those days in the South where she lived. So they, she was a bit of an outsider and her faith was very important to her. So there's, you know, a lot of her internal life was her struggles between, you know, her faith, the values of her society, um, all, you know, racism, all these things played out. Plus she was very, very ill at a young age and she died quite young. I think she was around 39. Um, and so, we have not as much from her as we could have, although she was a, quite a workaholic and considered her purpose on earth to write. And so she did up until the very end. I still have to watch the documentary, but for anyone who wants to watch it, it's, uh, it's available on PBS. And as I said, the music is on Spotify and there's a link to the music down in the YouTube description. And Miriam, we've done some workshops together all over the world, <laughs> or you know, we were in Austria together in Cologne. And uh, so I love fun. you're an amazing <laughs> instructor, mentor. And uh, a few years ago, we did this workshop where we showed clips of music and then how it really influences the outcome, the emotion. And so I wanted to recreate that today. But before we go into the clips, can you talk a little bit about that and why it's so important, especially in documentary, to be super cautious with the music and how just little tone differences can make a huge difference? Well, yeah, rather than cautious, I would say you have to be extremely intentional because everything you do with music will, it will affect the meaning of the footage. 
And so it's very important to be aligned with the vision of the director. We've got to be telling the same story. Otherwise it just, it diffuses the, you know, the power of the film, you know, people, it really dilutes it. The people don't understand the meaning and also music, you know, it, um, there's different ways it can be used. And uh, so you can use it as punctuation to reinforce something they're seeing, but you can also add new layers of meaning that aren't in the footage. And that's what we're gonna see today. Um, because it's very interesting when you take some, a very benign piece of footage, like what, we'll, like what we did. Um, it, you know, I mean, one thing I thought we might do is play it without any music and see if people know if, what the story is and then play it with different cues and see how that completely changed. Is this guy a good guy? Is he evil? Is he disgusting? You know, is he someone we should like or someone we should fear? You know, all of, <laughs> creepy, <laughs> don't, you don't want your kids around him. So, um, you know, and I, I call that the music story arc because sometimes the music is, like I said, reinforcing what's in this, what's going on on screen and other times it's exaggerating it, like putting an exclama exc exclamation point by bringing something out, really underlining it. Like someone says something, wait, stop. Ba -da -da -da. Now the audience is like, yeah, you know, they know what, you know, it's very intense. Or you could say, wait, stop. And the music is just not there. And so it's kind of like, you don't know what to feel as should we be worried. You know, wait, stop could mean, oh, don't go out in the street, there's a car coming. Or it could mean, stop, you've got my purse, you know. Or it can mean stop you're hitting my husband so it can mean all those things but we won't the music will guide us uh in some ways if you know and it can also he could be hitting someone and i could be playing circus music so now it becomes a comedy mm -hmm. so all these things are very important and um communication between a director and a composer must be thoroughly explored and clear because i need to understand exactly you know and then of course you could say uh I want it to be happy. Well, happy, okay. Do you know how many nuances of happy there are? You could start here where I'm sort of, huh, oh, it's nice to see you. Whoa, I haven't seen you in years. I can't wait till we can sit down and have a drink, you know? I mean, it can be anywhere. So um, that's the other thing music can do. It helps to sort of calibrate where we are emotionally and, and helps the audience sort of, it either can guide them or can confuse them. Sometimes you wanna confuse them and you don't want them to know. So you have this music, maybe we're watching two men shake hands and smile, but the music makes it sound like they're, tra they're trading some kind of espionage secrets, you know, or one of them has abducted the other one's kid, you know, and they're just trying to look like nothing's happening. So music is a great, has a huge effect on footage, so. You know, it's important to do our, a good job. I just love because that, yeah, I can't wait to see you. That's <laughs> me when I see you after the COVID again. And we have- Yeah, I know, I can't wait, man. <laughs> I just can't wait. So Miriam, let's just look at the clip without any music, just with the sound that was on the video. So here we go. That was an Oscar winning performance <laughs> in there, I would say. It was so nuanced. I mean, maybe we, this doesn't even need music because it's so it. clear, but actually so just the, for truth. the audience, we did that so we don't run into any right issues with studios or we did this. Oh, well, frankly, scene. I was looking forward to working with such an incredible actor. I just, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. And the DP, wow. <laughs> And the screenwriter. Oh, and yeah, the, the whole the, thing. You know, anything, you know, anyway. <laughs> so before we now go into the first clip, I have some questions. 
One, I really don't know. We always talk about temp music, but how does that work in the doc world? Is there temp music really? I, I oh, really yeah. Don't know. The editors, you know, especially in the doc world where editing, that's really where the, the actual film is made. The footage is shot. People go out and they start filming and there's the film they think they're making. Then when they get back, because there's no script and they can't control the environment or anything that happens. So when they get back to the cutting room, they may or may not have that movie. They may have no movie or they may have a completely different movie. That's why I always say documentaries are not for the meek. Working in documentary is thoroughly and totally challenging on every level. And that's why I admire the filmmakers so much because they're really incredibly brave. Um, so, you know, they may be editing for a year. They may discover that they have to go shoot more stuff because the story changed and now they have to fulfill it up with other footage, you know, that, that works with the new story. So because it goes on for a long time, um, oftentimes the composer isn't involved yet. I always tell my filmmakers, I'd love to be involved as early as you have anything, because, because if I start giving them ideas and we start developing back and forth, what's working as the editor's cutting, then they'll be end up using my music as the temp music specifically that's intended for this film, which I love because then we're really, then I'm part of the filmmaking team. We're really going, you know, thoroughly going. Uh, but so oftentimes, oh, sorry, no, well, please oftentimes uh, I don't get it until they've got a rough cut or, you know, so whenever they're ready for me, I'm, I'm very happy to jump in the sooner the better usually. So walk us a bit through now, you know, especially for the people that want to get into talk filmmaking or scoring for docs. So you've got this footage now, which I saw this uh, swing uh, uh, children's playground, the guy walking there. And uh, now you're going to meet with the director. And what are the first questions you would ask to that scene? Well, if I, if I only just saw the footage and didn't know what the scene was, I'd want to know what's the story? What is the narrative that you want to tell? And how can I help? So if it, you know, he could say or she could say, uh, "This guy is a you know he just got out of prison, and the first thing he does is go back to the playground." So we want to let the audience know he's a bad guy. Uh, or you might say to me, "You know, he came back to his old neighborhood where he grew up. He's very nostalgic. He remembers how that playground was there. Or maybe he had a son that died, and and you know, I mean, it could be anything." And the music that I put will really uh, help, especially if it's that opening scene, it will determine what the audience, the premise, you know, the, where they start, their point of departure, their foundation for understanding the film. So let's watch the first scene and, and you will see the difference. And, you know, we saw the footage, which is kind of, you know. It could be anything. Neutral, it could be anything. But I think we'll see how the music and especially it set it could set up the tone for the next ninety minutes, and uh, and 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 how important the music is, especially in doc filmmaking, because it it's a color. Without that, I think it's just yeah. such a plain field. Yeah, and also um, for them, for the your viewers to know that these are just cues from my library that I wrote for other films. I didn't write it for this, but when I take another kind of emotional our story arc and put it on this, it determines what the story is to a great degree. So let's pick, we have a total of five clips. So let's just start with the first. <laughs>
So that was the first option. So walk us through that a little bit, please. Well, you tell me, what did you feel when you watched it? <laughs> did you like the guy? <laughs> well, I have to say this for me was not as creepy as others. I thought <laughs> we'll see them later. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it, it sort of suggests a bit of emotional turbulence. So this guy has a reason to be there. He doesn't look like he's happy. No. Maybe it's stirring up old memories. Maybe he got beat up on that playground every day of his life. Or maybe, you know, he's staking out something, you know, like, like maybe he's going to kidnap somebody or whatever. So I think there's just an, uh, it's an unidentified turbulence, I think, that, but it's definitely dark. And uh, what, uh, what are the notes you usually uh, get from directors and how do you find, I know some directors you've worked several times with before, some are new. Do you, how do you find the language in with a doc uh, filmmaker for music? Uh, I mean, you've been in the business for so long. Is there advice you also give? Can you help? directors can you is there some questions you can ask to get out what you need yes I think the most important thing is that I know the information I need to do my job so I can be proactive in the discussion and I usually try to set them at ease some are more comfortable talking about music I mean but every director I promise you every director will react or respond in some way to the music so the first thing I say, well, am I telling the right story? Did you think that worked? And then I get them to talk about the story. I don't need them to tell me about the music. I need them to tell me if I'm telling the right story. Mm -hmm. That's the most important information I can get. Now that, that given, if they have specific ideas about where they want it to start or how they want it to evolve, maybe they would say something like, you know, I'd really like it to start lighter and then leave us creepy at the very end because mm -hmm. that would sort of make people sort of settle in and feel okay and then suddenly we give them a question mark at the end of the scene so those are the kinds of really useful discussions you know what is your intention what would work sometimes the, just putting music there will help them see the scene in a whole new way like they didn't even see what i saw in it and that's where a, a composer can add something to the discussion also is that a director may not be aware that something's not clear or that there's a creepy element that they may want to maybe foreshadow, but just in a very subtle way. You know, maybe the music can suggest, you know, like I said, if I just have a low tone at the end, then we could talk about now how we want to escalate and where it should happen. And, and we can actually pace it out so that it's perfectly, you know, perfectly creating the right, the right mood, the right communicating the right storyline and hitting with what we see on screen or not. You know, so all these things, you know, I don't, I can't read their mind. Sometimes I, I nail it the first time because I just get it. Sometimes it takes 20 tries. And I always tell them, I'm going to, we're going to work on the first 15 minutes of your film until I get it right. Until I'm telling, because now from then on, I'm going to be building on the ideas that work. So there's no point in me cruising through the film and going in wrong directions. Because also for them, it's so new. Maybe there was temp music in there that's been in for like six months and they're kind of having to shake it. Sometimes that's really hard for them. And sometimes they go, oh my God, I can't believe how much better this is. Now I see. And then they get excited because they see the power. If they can learn how to direct me, I can give them exactly tweaked to the nanosecond what they want, you know? And that's my desire. I want it to be a, something that captures exactly what they want because I, I'm working with them because I think they do good work and I want to help mm -hmm. them, you know, in any way I can to tell their story the way they want to. And I think that's such a great advice. I like that to, to, to not even work on the whole film. And I mean, to really do the first 10, 15 minutes and make sure you're on the same page, the, the tone yeah. is set for the film, because then I'm sure it makes it so much easier oh. for, the, for the additional 75. You don't end up working for three weeks and throwing half of it out. You know, and, and in fact, this film I've been working on now, it's called Beauty Isn't Pretty. And uh, we've been having the most fun because it's just me, the director and a producer and the ed producer editor. And so we're really going through every cue very thoroughly because it's a very unusual, the construction of the film is kind of unusual and it, it could really 
like the music is really important in organizing all these ideas. So we've really just stayed on each cue and it's been really fun because now I'm on the last cue and almost everything's done. You know, they have a few tweaks and I have to reconform, but we've really established what the sound universe of the film is for the music. Once I, because otherwise I get really confused. What is, what am I doing? You know, I don't even understand what I'm trying to do. Is when I sit down, if I have more questions than answers, then I need to call them and we need to talk. Because if I'm just sitting there, then I'm from then on, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. And I really don't know. Now, sometimes nobody knows. We don't know. And we're actually discovering it together, which is also really cool. If they're into the spirit of that, you just have to surrender to the process, you know. And um, some films are easier to figure out than others. So, you know, now, I mean, I, every film is totally different. Every group of people I work with is totally different. And you have to be very flexible and be able to work in different ways with different people, you know. But but the good news is since I'm older and I've been doing this a long time, usually I'm I'm almost always older than my directors. And so I'm able to share experience that I've had with them, you know, and help guide them so that they can enjoy the experience and not be freaking out. They really shouldn't freak out. It's really incredible experience. I like that you you really, you know, as a collaborator, you want to make the other party feel comfortable oh, and yeah. taken care of. And I think you are really good at that. Well, it's really a difficult process for them. I know for me, let's say I've been working on something even. OK, so I write all this music and then it's time to record. I bring in some incredible musicians. They start playing and they suddenly do something I didn't expect. And it sort of makes my head explode because I'm like, wow, that's musically really outstanding now how is it for the film so in that situation I might what I'll do is I'll record it the way that it was approved and I'll offer this option because I think it's improved and um but I but I tell you there's all kinds of surprising things that happen in the studio even with string parts that are written out yeah, I mean there's so much nuance in a real player you know my my patches my my uh you know uh sound bites and sound files they, they just sound how they sound but when you get a real player you get oh, just the decay of a real player letting go of a note i can't tell you the difference it makes in the music it's so i can't i usually sit there going i can't wait to hear that note decay naturally <laughs> instead of you know ending the way it does with you know a sample <laughs> oh i lost your sound let's listen to another uh, scene We like him a little better than the first one, but then at the end, I was not sure anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a little tiny downturn at the end. It feels very nostalgic to me. Yeah, like that's maybe what I thought in the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe he's thinking about something good there. Like he's not sure, you know, he comes home, he's not really sure how he feels about his childhood, some good memories, but towards the end, it seems like he's sort of like, eh, I don't think I want to stay here, I'm leaving. I'm going to go back where I came from. <laughs> So, uh, so do you talk about uh, intention early on, also before you start working on it, or do you always get the intention by by the footage that you see? Uh, is it always uh, very clear, or it yeah. could be either way? I mean, maybe sometimes I'll sit down and I mean, I find if I go out and drink beer with the director and just talk about the film, or other times they just send it to me ahead of time and I watch it and then we might talk about it, you know. Um, as long as I, I mean, it can be different ways. Different people are comfortable relating to the composer different ways. Some people bring you in as a co-friend, you know, part of the team. 
Others are like, you're over there and they send you stuff and get stuff back. So it's, it's just whatever they want it to be. I can know how to make up the difference because I, I've been doing this for over 30 years. So uh, has it happened to you that you worked, uh, you know, let's say on the first 15 minutes at least and, uh, and then showed it and you were totally off, like you oh, saw it in yes. a totally different way. Yeah, but, but I never consider that a waste because there might be a place for it later in the film or once I find it's so much easier to talk about music when you have something to talk about. Like I'd rather send them a cue that's all wrong and start talking about why it's wrong because that's easier for them to be able to be specific. They could say, no, no, that's the wrong instrument. It just doesn't fit. I don't like that sound. Or they could say, you know, it needs to be faster. It needs to be faster. So now they have something to, to talk about and it's mm -hmm. much easier. So I would always recommend, even if you're not sure. And I, you know, now I, I always say to them, I'm gonna send you stuff because I need your feedback. And so it may be wrong, it may not, but don't feel bad. Like the people I'm working with now feel bad if they even give me one rewrite. I can't believe it. I'm so used to doing many rewrites. <laughs> so, um, you know, some films just go easier as I get into it sooner, but it's very important to just be natural and open and be able to really talk about this stuff. You know, like it's not an indication that I'm not a good composer. I can do whatever you want, but I have to understand what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. Most of us are that way. Have you ever in your career taken feedback or critique on music personal? And if so, how, what changed so you don't take it personal anymore? Oh my God. I, when I was young, it was very, everything was precious and personal. That's why I try to, I, that's one of the reasons I really love teaching and, or mentoring now because I wasted many years in anguish. And, and once I understood some of these things, I realized I, you know, it was not me. I'm good at what I do, but I need to get the kind of information I need and I need to learn how to do that. So I try to, you know, I was crushed many times. I felt like, you know, I would, I used to race to do the whole movie and then go show it to them, you know, and then they're in the position of, oh my God, this person just came back after two months and showed me this thing and I don't like any of it, or I just like two things. You know, that's not a way to collaborate. You know, they have to be participants. And in fact, I don't want to work with people who don't want to participate. If they care about their film, they have to care about their music because the music can really ruin the film. And I've seen many, many documentaries, especially really high caliber docs with shitty music or music that does nothing to enhance the storytelling and sometimes actually works against it. Mm -hmm. So that's not, I, I don't see any point in creating a score like that. I'd rather not do it, you know. So I think it's really important that people understand the power of music and they, that, they, that they participate or they'll turn their film over and let the composer direct the music and they'll get what they get, you know? <laughs> well, let's see what we get next. We have <laughs> the third of five scenes. So let's see what that says.
tell us so what I liked here is, you know, the, the suspension and the actual, you know, like there was so little music in the beginning and I wanted more and more and more. I, I, I kind of wanted from the music, I, I wanted to understand more. So uh, can you tell us also how sometimes less is more? Oh, definitely. Well, first of all, you probably noticed the less is happening in the music, it slows down time. So the scene feels longer. So if you want it to feel kind of endless or longer, that's a good way to stretch out time is to have very little going on, a very slow melody line, very slow development. Um, if you want, if you feel like a scene is too is going too slow, I can make it feel like it's cruising along by get, you know doing faster music or having inner parts that you know anything that adds energy. So these are all ways you can use music to you know to influence how the viewer is, is experiencing what they're seeing and, and how they're understanding it. So this one, you know, it has a very dark, I felt like this might've been the scene of a crime. Maybe he, he had a child that died on that, you know, on that swing, you know, and he's just going back there and like, you know, so it really, you know, it's very dark and, but it's not like he's dangerous or creepy. It's more like he's his internal. That's the other thing, whose point of view is the music? Is it outside the character or are we now inside the character where he's feeling, this is what he's feeling, you know, that it's a very, very, very tragic kind of place. And who makes that decision? Is that something that you offer or that the director tells you from the get-go or, you know, like, do you talk about viewpoints in documentary or are you informed oh, yeah. by the footage? No, I, uh, it's very important. Uh, a director, just like a director has to direct where to point the camera, they have to direct, you know, the editor. They have to make sure that the story is being told. Um, they usually have an intention for the meaning of the footage, but sometimes I can make a suggestion, as I said before, where I were able to that I've seen something in their own footage that they didn't notice. Now that can be good or bad or ugly, you know. But um, you need to have the openness to be able to talk about all those things because I might be responding to something. And then they they can either like it or not like it, but I'm responding to something when I do it. So that usually the composer is besides the editor, I'm the first person that sees the film put to, starting to be put together. So you know, getting outside feedback, you know, when you work on something for a long time with two people in the room and nobody else sees it, even if there's three people, you know, the first time someone else experiences it, you get a real sense of how well it's communicating your ideas if it's doing what you thought it was doing. And if there's a way to take what's there and bring out, tease out the things you want it to be doing. And music is the perfect solution, music and sound, because you can really determine the point of view, you can determine you know, uh, the emotional space of, of the character, or sometimes, like I said, it's outside the character and it's more of a narr narrative of what's going on. So it, the music can be commenting or it can be reflecting or it can be adding. There's so many ways to use it. So it's a very powerful tool. And in the wrong hands, it's deadly. Or well, especially, you know, you can tell a completely different story. In oh, yeah. You really mess up the, the film. The director's vision will just get lost in it because there's too many cooks, you know. So that's why it's very important that there be mutual respect, especially composers have to understand that this is a person, especially with docs, Sometimes they mortgage their home. Sometimes they're in a war zone where they're risking their actual life. You know, um, they are doing serious stuff. I need to respect what they're doing and really get mm -hmm. behind them, you know, support it. So let's watch the next scene. <laughs> let's see what's happening here.
you know what's really interesting um you can tell that like by what i chose to put on here you can tell that i already sort of had an idea about the footage just from looking at it so this is the kind of thing that will happen when a composer first looks at it and starts writing that i have a definitely you don't hear any like pop type stuff you don't hear any create any silly music because when i put it on i actually tried a lot of different things but it didn't work so badly that i didn't even go there so there's a certain kind of range of dark you know of like nostalgic to dark or sad or tragic to dark that i just did instinctively and that's kind of how it would work when you're working with a filmmaker you know like i have an instinct that uh, based on what i see and sometimes they'll come back and say well i really want you to make this you know sadder and i'd say but i don't see it i i don't know it doesn't feel right to me maybe it needs to be more subtle you know those that's another uh so music is so nuanced you have to be able to get into the real details of it and and understand how to flesh it out and make it feel right with what we see because the intention might be certain like Miriam, I want that to look funny. That guy is a clown, but I'm not seeing it. Are you? How would I make you a clown in that shot? It just isn't there in the shot. So that's another important thing that has to be discussed. You may need to reshoot that if you want it to be funny. Because mm -hmm. I can push it funny all the way, but it'll never be funny. It'll just be false. So people have an instinct for what's authentic and what you know what you can get away with i never want to go beyond what i think is that i can actually successfully execute you know yeah but i think you know i, I think that probably also comes with uh experience to to be able to verbalize that and you know i also think you know you know for young composers it, you know it, it takes a lot of confidence also to to say I know you want that funny, but I, as the viewer, don't really see it. So we have to kind of look at it or maybe do something in editing, but I can only go so far in music. So it still feels authentic to me. Right. And, but I, I think it takes a lot of experience and confidence to, to, to verbalize that. Yeah. And, and you, you know, it's really important to establish, but because I'm older and experienced, I'm able to put others at ease. And I find there's a many, many ways I do it. You know, I become very non-threatening and I'm very, I don't get upset if they like changes and stuff. And, and I think- You could I, never I, be threatening <laughs> anyway, even if you tried. <laughs> I know, that's what my dog trainer says. <laughs> I'm not an alpha. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, so um, I think that, that, and I work to do that. I wanna create an atmosphere where they're comfortable and then eventually asking me my opinion because it, my opinion can matter, but it doesn't matter if they don't agree. You know, I will do the best I can, but I guess my fallback is I always say, I would, I would never want to create something that hurts your movie. And this, I believe will hurt your movie, you know? So either we need to do something to, you know, reshoot it or, or you know, maybe edit it differently or ask and another thing I'll say, well, show it to some other people and ask them. But the truth is sometimes I have to show them what it would be. And that's okay. You know, they have to just experience it for, with their own eyes. And most of the time they go, they understand once they see it because they can feel that it's wrong. I mean, there are people trying to do something authentic and they can feel that it's fake, you know? So I think, you know, whatever way it takes for me to kind of work it through with them, then I do it. Now, if we reach a real, like if they just don't care and they want it and they want it, then I kind of suggest I'm not really the right composer. Because the last thing I'll ever do, I'd rather leave a job than, you know, do something that would hurt their movie. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that also takes a lot to to say that and to yeah. to say, you know, I but, wouldn't have uh, done that know, twenty years ago. <laughs> no, but I think you know that, and we'll talk about that later. But that has a lot to do with integrity and your integrity also, and uh, and your view of uh, of the industry also. But uh, let's talk about that in a little bit. I want to watch the last oh. uh, the five scenes now. Let's see what <laughs> says.
know, one of the things I noticed when I was watching that is another thing I really love to share with people is that within the visuals, like we don't have dialogue here. If we did, it would be part of it. There is so much rhythm going on. There's the swing. There's like kids walking, somebody walks across, you know, there's the sound of this little Celeste thing in the background, the toy box or something. There's, uh, you know, there's, just, there's other sound like a car going by. This is all the rhythm of the scene and finding the sweet spot for the composer is really great where you have something that's sort of like, I didn't really, I didn't write anything for this. This is all just stuff I have. And so I would pull it up and I would feel like it was working. Why is it working? Because when the swing starts swinging, the music picks up, it just does it, you know? And so it feels like it's all in a rhythm. And so it creates this flow. And when there's dialogue that comes, you know, and then someone walks across the scene and then, and, then, and I find those little ways of kind of, Poke, the music can poke out sometimes and sometimes it's just inside, but it feels right. It's just all feeling. And I think most musicians know that from playing in bands. But you know when you're all locked in and your intention is all the same and the rhythm and I pick up my horn and do something and somebody else takes off from that. You know what I mean? And it's like a handoff. So all these things, I think playing live, I was in bands for 20 years, playing live really affects how I, how I use music. Because I really used to audiences reacting right then in the moment, you know, to what we did. So you see the effect of the music and, and then at, it's kind of a maturity that happens when you become a film composer. You actually all instinctively know that stuff because you've been on stage watching people react, you know, for 20 years. So I think it's really, um, it's, you know, I say to young composers, if you don't have the opportunity to play live, go see live music, you know, and experience it for yourself what happens when, when a performer does different stuff, you know, and how the people, you know, how the flow gets going. Cause music is all about the flow, you know, it's rhythm and, and then this melody floating over it. And so anyway, it's all, you know, it's, it's such a visceral experience. Before we finish this conversation, uh, I want to talk a little bit, uh, and you talked a little bit about your career, you know, from performing in bands and, uh, and, uh, but I know, uh, you know how rewarding it is to write for documentaries and that for you it was really important to, to find your path within the film music industry and not only to find it but you created your path yeah. that is fulfilling that that feeds you artistically but also on an activism level and so everything comes together and can you talk about that and about the importance and you know especially for young composers who are going into you know into film scoring and you know how how important the passion is and to finding what is yours oh definitely that's one of the things i've noticed as i've been mentoring i've been mentoring for a long time and and the younger filmmakers today i mean the younger one you know composers future composers they're very, uh, it's very important to them that they, that they, um, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I want to go write beer commercials because it really satisfies my soul, or I want to go play in a mall, or I want to go play in a disco, you know, maybe some people do, but, but I think most of us are artistically inclined. And so I, I, you get to a point where you just want to do music all the time and you just have to figure out how the hell you're going to support yourself. That's really how I started doing it. I was like, I don't know. I have to figure out a way to support myself because I really want to just sit home and do music all day, all the time. So that's where it starts for most of us. And I didn't learn this till much later in my career. You know, I, when I started out, after I gave up performing and realized that this was my passion, I hadn't discovered my passion for documentaries, but... I was just so enamored of, the, of writing, even for bad horror movies and stuff. I did a ton of them and, you know, wall-to-wall -wall music and just huge electric guitars and orchestras. And, and so, um, you know, one day I woke up after 10 years of doing that and doing uh, industrials and, you know, mostly stuff that didn't resonate for me. I just thought, you know, I'm solvent now, but I'm miserable. Like nothing I'm doing, there's nothing I want to show anybody except I was writing for this wonderful circus. That was the only artistic thing I was doing. And so um, I decided I was gonna stop doing it 
because I just thought, you know, this is just killing my soul. I'd rather go do something else for money and just do music at home. And so that's the night I met, you know, very soon after I met this filmmaker, Arthur Dong, who had made this incredible documentary. I, I did a few docs, but not anything important. And then his documentary was about uh, men who were, he went and interviewed men who were imprisoned for murdering gay men. And he just, it was like staggering to hear those guys talk about why they did it and why they felt they should, you know, and, and were entitled to. And, um, and of course, then it went to Sundance and he took me to Sundance with him. And I had this whole experience where I suddenly saw this community of documentary filmmakers that were like, oh, the work was incredible. They're, you know, we share values. They cared very deeply about the material. And I realized that that's what I should do, combine my passion for, you know, I wanna to contribute to making the world better. And I also am very naturally a musician and wanna be doing music, you know, so that's how it happened for me. So I always tell young people, you know, whatever your passion is, if it's games, if it's tentpole Marvel movies, whatever it is, you know, figure out what makes you really happy doing it. Because if you end up doing something you don't really want to do, then you're not going to ever be happy, even if you're rich and famous. But if you fig figure out what really inspires you, I could, I mean, I'm pretty old now and I'm still never use my inspiration for what I'm doing because it, it's just passionate for me. And, uh, it, and it, it, it's like, I'll do anything to actualize and make it a good project, you know? So, you know, you don't want to spend your life, you know, I always used to ask myself when I get older and I look back and I'm in my sixties and I look back, what am I going to think about my decisions? And I can tell you that for me, I have no regrets at all. I've done the life I wanted to live and I've done music. I'm really proud of and worked with people I admire, you know? And so what better life is there for an artistic person than to feel like you found your, you know, thing, but it didn't exist. I found it and I created it for myself. And nowadays, that's kind of what we have to do. We have to be entrepreneurial and, and wear a lot of hats and figure out how to monetize this stuff. <laughs> it's getting harder, I'll tell you. Yeah, but I love it because I, I, I really think you carved your career. You know? I definitely carved um, it with a and machete. That's an, a whole nother conversation we can have another time, but also, you know, how you, you know, you, you know, you worked with, you know, keeping the rights and, and, and you know, and, yes. and all that. But that is another conversation we have. But I, I, I think you shared uh, really great wisdom today. And I'm, I'm very I hope it grateful helps. for that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, so is there uh, someone who wants to go into documentary, uh, scoring for documentary? What is like the top advice you would give them? <laughs> well, you know, um, when I realized what I wanted to do, I wanted to become part of the documentary community. I mean, sure, I can hang out with other composers and musicians and engineers and stuff, but my passion is their work, you know, the documentary filmmakers. And so I made it my business to just get to know as many as I could and network and, you know, going to film festivals and seeing the work and, you know, being in Q and A's and learning about what motivates people and being authentically interested, you know, in what, in the work that's happening. I know that a lot of, I mean, over the last maybe 10 years, a lot of people have become more interested, young composers, they're finding it's more of an artist lifestyle. I feel like I have an artist life. Even though I do deadlines and stuff, uh, it's really about the work and, you know, and, and achievement, high achievement on their end and my end. And so um, we just match up really well. Um, so I think it's really, you know, figure out where you wanna be and then, and then be very creative. Creativity isn't just for music. You need to take your creativity and focus it on your life. What kind of a life do you want to live? You know, who, you know, how do you want, what are your, what really matters to you? Is it getting the big, you know, is it, is it getting an Academy Award, which I'm not going to lie. There's, there was a long time in my life where I thought that's what I want to get. I want to be the first woman. Well, that passed me by, but I'm still really happy, even though I don't have an Academy Award, <laughs> but it's okay because I work with the on Academy nominated films and stuff. So I mean, that's fine with me, you know? Um, so yeah, my advice is if you have a feel for something, like I don't, didn't always know what I was looking for, but I kept my eyes open. And when I felt something, 
I went, that feels like me. That feels right. And I just went full tilt for that, you know? So there's plenty of room to move around in our business. There's so many different kinds of content. You know, there's so many opportunities. I mean, what I'm seeing now, this explosion of streaming, so many people are working on streaming on popular shows on Netflix and stuff. You know, I mean, that was getting a TV gig was really hard when I was coming up. Um, so now there's all these other opportunities, but the biggest challenge is the monetization because they, the royalties are good, are lower on streaming. And, you know, that's a whole conversation, but you have to have a business model of some kind. It's not going to just magically happen. You can't do a good job with your music budget if you have to also pay your mortgage and you know whatever else you have going on and put food on the table for your family suddenly you only have five thousand dollars instead of thirty thousand dollars to spend on musicians see what i mean you have to figure out how to make that bigger and that's getting more and more difficult and i just want to point out there is uh, this uh, panel is in collaboration with the alliance for film composers and if you go on their youtube there is also a video on real change that we uh, videotaped yeah. a few weeks ago. So check that out because that talks exactly about monetization and streaming services. So check out this video. And uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Miriam, for, for taking the time, for sharing your wisdom. You're, you're very inspiring. And uh, I'm, thank you for doing that with us. Let's go on a trip again. And let's go on a trip again. Soon. Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and for the uh, audiences, um, check out Perspective Forum on Facebook. Join them. And for more videos, check out filmmusichouse.com and check out the Flannery score on Spotify. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, Miriam. Bye, Thomas. <laughs>